thanks to everyone who's met and talked with me so far. It's it's been enlightening, and it's actually I see that there's not only is there cool research being done here at Nimbus, there's also a uh, warm-hearted, cool people as well. So that that always goes a long way. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my research, which is essentially in network theory and network science. And the whole idea, the big idea, what, what we're trying to do is is build new um, metrics for summarizing networks. And we're trying to do it in a very intuitive way. Um, so the work I'm doing is, of course, I, a lot of the work I do, I try not to work alone as much as possible. Um, my premier partner here is Jacopo Baggio, and he's in the Center for Behavior and Institutions, uh, Institutions and the Environment at Arizona State University, which used to be called something else. Now it's CBIE. Um, Eli Fenichel, which is essentially a mathematical bioeconomist at Yale University, formerly of ASU as well. Marco Jansen, who's the director of CBIE at Arizona State University, and Joshua Abbott, who's an uh, sustain, I call him an econometrician who works at the School of Sustainability at um, Arizona State University. And so we all got interested in this because network science was getting hot and sexy and we wanted to sort of put our stamp on it as well. Um, um, but, but what was the motivation for this work? Um, we were, myself and Eli especially, were very interested in this question that you see before you. What kind of landscape structures should we uh, preserve for dwindling wildlife populations? Um, we know that landscape fragmentation is um, um, is uh, w habitat reduction is is limiting landscapes for wildlife, and we know that habitat reduction also causes um, resource scarcity, inbreeding, and and also increase encroachment threats, and and all these lead to um, depletion of our of our wildlife populations. Um, however, at the same time. Um, Landscape fragmentation leaves these spatially intact or in distinct patches of habitat on which we still see um, populations propagating and we still see high abundance. And dispersal between these patches, even though it's really, um, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of uh, dangerous, it still leaves some possibility for dispersal. And so what a lot of managers are dealing with now is how can we better understand the spatial distribution of the remaining habitat, how it's arranged in the world, and how can we uh, use that knowledge to sort of boost species persistence and species dispersal. And so what I'm going to show you today is how, I, um, how I'm starting to better understand the linkage between habitat patch structure and species persistence and dispersal using network theory and especially specifically what I'm doing is I'm using network theory to summarize these networks, index networks, and, and uh, force a linkage between network structure and network function. And I'll, I'll go into it in depth what that actually means. And so uh, networks are becoming an increasing popular way of visualizing um, a linkage between different uh, entities or different individuals or different things. Here's a simple explanation, it's a simple visualization from ecology where these green nodes here represent uh, green habitat patches on which you have um, interaction between species and persistence and abundance and different things happen. And the blue corridors or the blue edges that connect these nodes serve as dispersal corridors that facilitate individual dispersal of, of, of wildlife. Right, now, the whole idea, the whole theory stemming from this visualization is that by understanding and quantifying these kinds of structures, we gain some sort of predictive power over the, the processes going on on them, be they be biological, that species dispersal, species persistence, or be they be social, the spread of ideas, the spread of um, infection, spread of rumors and different things. If we can quantify these structures, then we can use that to sort of better understand them. Right. With network theory comes the use of network metrics. And uh, single dimension or one dimensional summary metrics are a great thing because they allow us to visualize a simple relationship between a network index or a network structure and whatever process it is we're measuring on them. 
So here's a simple example from epidemiology. Here the nodes are representing different individuals. So green nodes are susceptible individuals, red nodes are infected individuals, black nodes are recovered individuals. And one method for representing this network is using what we call the spectral radius. And I'll get into in-depth knowledge about how we actually compute that. It's actually, it's, it's all linear algebra, matrix algebra. It's not a big deal. Um, so each one of these networks has a certain network indicator. In this case, we're using the inverse of the spectral radius. And you can put in, we're using that to measure um, the spread of infection, which is measured on the y-axis by basically how many infected individuals do you have in the system. The structure of this network we're looking at is such that any network that's a little bit more connected than it, you see persistence of the disease. Any structure that has less connectivity than it, going backward, you see that the disease dies out. And so we like summary metrics because they allow us to draw these simple pictures. But you can also sort of envision what, where the big issues are. Networks measure, uh, allow us to visualize local heterogeneities, but once you start to summarize those networks with one-dimensional <coughs> summary metrics, you gloss over all those local heterogeneities. And so I could put two networks next to each other that obviously look different, but if we use one summary metric, and a spectral radius is a very famous one that people use all the time, you could index two separate networks the same way, they could have the same spectral radius, but they mean two different things for the disease process. And so here's where you have a real big issue, is that summary metrics aren't doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Right? They're not giving us the sort of relationship that we want to see. Right? So s the solution is sort of simple. Well, why are you using one metric? Maybe you should use more than one metric. And a lot of researchers have talked about the fact that maybe a multi-metric approach to this is probably the way to go. You know, maybe two s networks are the same when you look at this one metric, but if you look at more and more metrics, maybe they're actually very different. Um, the issue with that is that there's no formal way or w no hierarchical method for, look for distinguishing between all the different metrics you should be looking at. You know, why do you pick these two or these three? And so this is where we come in and we try to um, propose a hierarchical method where we have um, certain metrics that you look at, and it basically goes down the line. And the way we propose these multi-metrics using this hierarchical approach is, is uh, we're motivated by um, uh, the theory of statistical moments. And so if you think of statistical moments, they are basically um, uh, um, systematically, they're, they're basically features of a distribution that you calculate that tell you something about that distribution. So you have the mean, you have the variance, you have the skewness, that's the third moment going on. Fourth moment is cortosis, and there's more that you can calculate, but they don't make that much in intuitive sense anymore. I'll show you how I calculate those later on, but essentially the idea between, behind my hierarchy is that I have one top measure that measures average um, connectivity around the whole network, and as I go down, down the list, I'm building these other metrics based on statistical moments that say something about the distribution of connectivity in the nodes that make up the networks. And I'll show you how I do that using essentially eigenmetrics, which have to do with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Um, and then after I build up this hierarchy, you also want to test this on something, right? And so I'm going to be looking at measuring outcome variation in ecological networks, but specifically habitat networks um, of, we'll talk about them later, ferrets and prairie dogs. And what I'm looking at is um, putting a linkage between the network metrics that I develop and three different ecological processes. That's the spread of a single species from one patch to multiple patches, um, the survival of one species, one metapopulation species, on that network, and one that I'm not going to talk about today, but one that was really a big motivator for doing this work is the coexistence of some sort of predator prey species on this network as well. Um, the uh, ecological model, the data for the ecological model, is driven by agent based representations of black footed ferret and prairie dog networks. So when we started doing this work, I was very uh, to say the least, it, 
I was obsessed with predator-prey models and predator-prey models that worked that worked beautifully for the sort of mathematical representations that we were into. And, and these guys work perfectly because the ferret preys exclusively on the black-tailed prairie dog, and it also uses its habitat to raise its own young. So there's a big trophic relationship between these two species. There's a great um, spatial relationship between these two species as well. Um, the black-footed ferret is an uh, endangered species. And so they're looking for different um, prairie dog habitat um, structures where they can safely reintroduce those ferrets into. Now, the black-tailed prairie dog is, uh, has, it's, it's, it occupies less than 10% of its original range, and that range is scattered all across southwest, southwest United States. And so it's, it's, it's known, it's, it's sort of general knowledge that the black-tailed prairie dog lives as a metapopulation species. Right. Dispersal is very important for the propagation of, um, for, uh, to, to keep abundance levels in the black-tailed prairie dog high. And so when we think of this idea of network theory and network science, the black-tailed prairie dog um, population really fits that structure because it is a matter of population species. Okay. So here's an example of, uh, of a black-tailed prairie dog meta population in uh, southwest um, of, of South Dakota, in Kanata Basin. These different squares actually represent um, areas where ferrets have been reintroduced to, but these little gray squares in between are actually little prairie dog towns. Prairie dog towns host a family of different prairie dogs, and so they, they tend to agglomerate these together because there's a lot of dispersal between them. But then where dispersal becomes an issue is dispersal between these bigger patches here. Right. It's been largely documented that dispersal between a lot of these different patches happen along low-lying drainage systems. Along these low-lying drainage systems, you're pretty flat. And um, essentially, um, successful dispersal of a prairie dog from one patch to another is highly related to distance. So the longer the distance, the higher likelihood that you're not going to make it across. And so if you can envision an exponential distribution where you have your x-axis being the distance of, of two different patches and y being the probability of successful dispersal, the larger the distance, the less likely they are um, to make it across. And this work goes back to stuff that Mike Bevers did in the 90s. Um, and so you could take this picture here, which is essentially a map, and you can draw a weighted graph representation of it. And this is just a three-point um, three example. And it's really from this idea that we use to build up what I call eigenmetrics. And the eigenmetrics are what I'm going to use to make this hierarchy of, of, of metrics that I'm looking at. And so very simple. If you have these three patches of land where we have prairie dogs on, Say you have these distances between them, and these distances essentially characterize, um, uh, give a measure of successful dispersal in prairie dogs. You can write out the adjacency matrix form for it. All right, adjacency matrix because we're dealing specifically with distance um, networks here, they have to be non-negative, and they're also symmetric in this case. Now, just with non-negativity. What that gives you is the Perron-Fabinius um, theory holds. And so you have a spectral radius or a dominant eigenvalue that's um, positive and highest in magnitude. Now, in network science, that dominant eigenvalue is also what they call the spectral radius and also what they call the average distance across the network. If you think about, for me, something that's very important is the units. The units on these edges are kilometers. They say something about distance. The units here are kilometers as well. The units of your eigenvalue in this case are kilometers also. And so the larger your spectral radius, the large, um, the larger um, a larger spectral radius means your network tends to be more disconnected. A smaller spectral radius means your network is largely connected. So this idea of of what the spectral radius means is different when you think about weighted ne networks versus when you think about unweighted networks. So keep that in mind. In my case, a larger spectral radius means you have a largely disconnected network. All right. 
the great thing about having Perone Frobenius is your dominant eigenvalue that's always positive also has um, I, an eigenvector that has all positive components. And your eigenvector, which in network theory they refer to as the eigenvector centrality, has all positive components, and each one of those components says something about the nodes in your system. It says something about the net connectivity of each node in the system. And if you think about the scale as well, here in the spectral radius, as you increase the spectral radius, an increased spectral radius means you have a more disconnected network. A higher, these uh, values here are, are non-dimensional, but the higher they are, um, the more disconnected that node is. And so a lower number here, a lower entry means you're largely connected, a higher number means you're largely disconnected. And so this is really a basis for where that hierarchy begins. Because here, yeah, I have one overall measure of network connectivity. There I have a distribution of node connectivity. And when we think about statistical moments, that's where I'm, I'm, that's where I'm, I'm uh, implementing that moment structure on. All right, so what am I doing? In a hierarchy, I try to start at the top with the most general explanation for connectivity in the network, and then I go down the list with statistical moments to try to um, break down differences between two different networks. Um, just like thinking of a statistical distribution, if two distributions really truly are different, somewhere down that breakdown of the moments, you'll see that difference in the numbers, in the numerical features. Um, so it, in my hierarchy, I start with the spectral radius, and then I go down to the eigenvector centrality mean, the mean of that eigenvector centrality, going down to variance and skewness. And we can go on down to cortosis and more, but at some point I had to stop because I had to graduate. So, so that's the hierarchy. Um, what we found a little later on was that um, the eigenvector centrality mean and the eigenvector centrality variance are actually, uh, there's a one-to-one -one correlation between. And this is because the eigenvector the eigenvector centrality is actually always normalized. So if you go through and work out the, the, um, work out the, the variance equation, you'll see that the eigenvector centrality mean shows up there, and there's a one-to-one -one correlation between them. And I can go through that later on. No need to do that now. But essentially, I get to pick between using the mean and the variance. And I just pick one of those values, and I pick the variance. Because the interpretation of what the variance is saying was something new and something different. And I'm going to break down what those things mean in a second. All right. So if we think again about the eigenvector centrality, it has a collection of measures in them. And it basically tells you something about how connected each node is in your network. Um, so if you take the variance of that, it's basically measuring the level of heterogeneity and the connectivity of each node. If you had zero variance, zero EC variance, that means every single node is connected in the same kind of way. All right. The same thing with, if you think about what symmetry is measuring. Symmetry measures the, the net proportion of highly influential patches. How do I define a, a highly influential patch? If you think of some mean level of, of, of influence, that's the mean of the eigenvector centrality, then networks that have a lower um, EC score than the mean are low contributors, and networks that have a higher EC score ha are high contributors to connectivity. Let's switch. And so, if you think of a negative skew here and a positive skew, essentially, well, if you have a lot more points that are to the right of your mean, then you have a lot more points that are lowly connected in your system. And the opposite is true there. Nothing's better than looking at a picture. And so what we're looking at here are two separate diagrams. These are actually spatial networks, and distance means something here. The scale is the same on both these networks. They're the same, they have the same spectral radius, but they differ in their um, eigenvector centrality variance. And why can you see that? Here we have zero variance. That means every node here is connected in the same way. I have one node that's close to me. Everybody else is pretty far from me in the same way. Same over there, same over there. Here it's a little bit different because for a lot of these nodes, 
everybody's connected in the same way. I have one close to me, and I have a lot of people that are further. Here is the same, but three is different because he's a lot more connected to everything. All right, so that's one way to explain non-zero variance between these two things. However, they have the same spectral radius, so you have to go through two different levels of measures to see this difference. But of course, visually, the difference was always there. This is two networks that also look different, but again, you have to go down three levels this time. So they both have the same spectral radius. They both have the same variance. Where they differ is your skewness. And what does that mean? Again, remember, a negative skew means that you have a high number of lowly influential patches. That means everybody is largely disconnected. Right. He's largely disconnected, he's largely disconnected, he's largely disconnected. Number three in the middle, he's the hub. He goes everywhere. But a network with a positive skew, he's largely connected to stuff. He's largely connected, largely connected, largely connected. All these guys are. And then you have a couple of nodes that are largely disconnected. Again, visually, when you look at these things, it's clear to see the difference. But when we're trying to build metrics to say that there really is a difference, in this case, you have to go down three levels for it to actually make sense. All right. So those are the metrics I was planning on dealing with for now. And again, just uh, remember, we're trying to see how these metrics fare in predicting these different ecological processes. So the two that I'm going to focus on today in the interest of time are spread and survival. Um, how did we measure spread? Um, again, we wanted to see if we could link, um, link network structure to the time it takes to spread. And the way we measured spread in our network models was that we plopped a population of prairie dogs on one patch, and we measured how long it took for them to um, populate every single patch in our network. We're only working with six network patches at this time. When we looked at survival, again, we want to draw a relationship between our network structure and the time to extinction, how long it takes for the last individual, the last prairie dog in our system to die out. And what we did there is, again, we put a population of prairie dogs on every single patch, and we just waited, you know, with dynamics. We waited I eventually. At some point, a lot of the models I work with, it turned out that every, uh, some, every member was going to die out at some point. And so when building this model that we're going to use to um, sort of approximate um, prairie dog dynamics, we didn't start from scratch. Um, Alan Hastings and Aaron Klavanoff worked with, I guess, the most recent prairie dog ferret model I know, which is in 1991, but it was all we could find at the time. And so the agent-based model I, ended bil uh, I, I built up in the end is based on this age-structured deterministic model that they worked on in the early 90s. Um, what I did is I took that age-structured deterministic model, I, um, I summed over all the ages, so I, I just made it a big um, individual model instead of an age-structured model. And then I also um, discretized the system, and I made a lot of the agent um, interactions and agent actions probabilistic. The reason why I did that is I wanted to test the predictive power of my metrics versus sort of um, probabilistic outcomes and things. So I wanted to see how powerful they were at predicting those things. Because we know, we know in reality everything's uncertain. So I, I tried to put that into, into the model as well. The dispersal dynamics are based on work I did in the past, um, trying to look at why individual species move from one patch to another. With, with respect to prairie dogs, it has a lot more to do with interspecies competition than anything else. Um, and of course, um, the predator will always move in search of the prey. This is the case for ferrets. Um, and then of course, how I determine successful dispersal is based on work by Mike Bevers and John Hoff from the past, where, again, we're just saying, think about the exponential, negative exponential distribution. As distance increases between two patches, the likelihood that a, a dispersing prairie dog makes it to that next patch is less and less. And so in building the networks, uh, I, I ran into another issue, is that when, 
in the first iteration of the model, we tried to just randomly generate networks and then, um, and then uh, sort of classify them with the different metrics I had. And what kept coming up is that we couldn't generate networks that had specific network properties. And in hindsight, it made sense. It's because a lot of these um, metrics are sort of intertwined and they rely on each other. And so some of these networks that we wanted to generate just really didn't exist. And so what we had to do was reverse engineer our networks and say, all right, well, let's pick out the certain network metrics that we want and then let's reverse engineer and bring out that adjacency matrix that gives us the networks that should be, um, that should be, that should be uh, developed. And so we did this for 107 networks, and we did six fully linked habitat patches because in the prairie dog and ferret literature, around really 5 to 13 was, was the kind of patches that they were looking at for the populations that they were interested in. Um, we did five separate levels of spectral radius, so something like a low spectral radius, high spectral radius, intermediate, and we did that for, and then within those five levels, you can look, consider a tree diagram, we did five levels of variance and then five levels of skewness as well. Um, we had to bound the ranges of the link weights, otherwise we were looking at an immense combination of different networks, and so we bounded the link weights between one kilometer and 20 kilometers because in the literature the average dispersal of a uh, black-tailed prairie dog is actually two kilometers and the average dispersal of a, of a ferret is four kilometers and so we use a really really high bound to say look anything past this really means death for a dispersing ferret or prairie dog and so we didn't have to worry about that and we used one kilometer to, to distinguish between two distinct patches because in a lot of the literature we looked at and a lot of the management literature, this is the demarcation they were using to, to um, show that two patches were actually distinct. So that's where those numbers were coming from. And then of course, because of the probabilistic nature of the agent um, actions, we had to do a lot of repetitions of the model. Um, the model was implemented in NetLogo. Right. So before I get to a lot of the results, I just want to give you a basic idea of what um, the relationship between a lot of the metrics and a lot of the processes we're doing. And a lot of the relationships are sort of down to earth. They, they kind of make sense. So as you increase the spectral radius, remember these are in units of kilometers, units of distance. As you increase the average distance to spectral radius, you're making the network more disconnected. And so as you increase spectral radius, the time to um, network occupation, or the time it takes a dispersing uh, population of prairie dogs to spread to all the patches is going to increase over time. And it looks exponential. There's, of course, some variation, but the trend is clear. And that sort of makes sense. If you look at eigenvector centrality variance, EC variance, you see that um, the time to network occupation, the time to spread, actually decrease as you increase variance. You have to think, why is that? Well, when you're increasing variance to the maximum, Increasing variation means what? You have two nodes that are at sort of the ends of connectivity. So you have a really disconnected node and you have a really connected node. The fact that you have that really connected node, that hub, is what's driving really quick dispersal. Is once a prairie dog gets there, he's going to get everywhere. Right? So again, there's variation in the results, but the trend is also kind of clear. One thing you see throughout this whole presentation is I got nothing from skewness, absolutely nothing. So, in fact, forget the trend line. I shouldn't even look at that. It, it didn't make any sense then, and it's, I'm still trying to work out what are the relationships between skewness and anything here. Because something that I found out that I'll talk about later is when we actually go and we do a regression analysis and we look at the kind of models that help explain um, spread time, it, it turns out that actually putting skewness into the mix is able to, it's able to boost our representation of spread, but skewness by itself is not a representation of anything. And you'll see when I do these 3D diagrams in the end that it actually does have a relationship. Now we've looked at spread, now we're going to look at survival versus all these different metrics. And again, there's a lot of variation, but it's clear. Prairie dogs need dispersal. They need to be able to move from one patch to another. And so as you increase 
as you decrease connectivity between a patch, the likelihood of survival for a long time is going to decrease as well. There's a lot of variation, though. Right? Th this is all motivation for why we should look at more metrics, but th the trend is there. Variance is the same thing. As long as you have a hub in your system, connectivity across the whole network is there. And for a prairie dog, that's very important. And so even though there's a lot of variation, the trend is clear. You see higher uh, survivability in um, networks with increased variance. Even though we draw the trend line here, I would suggest you don't consider EC skewness at all. <laughs> right. so, so what were the big results? And, and I'm going to break down sort of the big ideas that come from, um, from what we've done so far. And with metric correlation, there was just one big idea I wanted to highlight. What we're doing here is we're looking at a correlation of the metrics I've developed with other famous network metrics that have shown up um, in the network literature. There's average degree length, there's global efficiency, shortest path, local efficiency, clustering coefficient. And here are the metrics I developed, which are the spectral, well, not I, the metrics I use, spectral radius, EC variance, and skewness. And what we see is that with spectral radius, we have correlations with metrics um, that differ from the correlations that ha uh, met other metrics have with EC variance. And so there's not a lot of correlation between the metrics I'm using. So they're measuring something different about the network. And they're also not causing overlap between metrics that are already um, sort of popular in network science as well. So that was a good thing to see. And when you think about what statistical moments are measuring, it al also makes sense. They should be measuring different things about a distribution. So when we look at reg regression analysis, the simple result there was clear. Um, using all three of the metrics that I developed is always better than using any combination of one or any combination of two other metrics. And the reason why it is is because, well, one, they do play a role, and two, there's no overlap between all these metrics. And so it's always better to use all three in all these different cases of, and all these different ecological processes. And now we've seen exactly the linkage between um, one metric and one ecological process. But the only reason why we're looking at these multiple metrics is because we want to see, well, is there a dependence on, does the fact that there's a relationship between two different metrics, does that affect what happens to my ecological process? And is there a trend? And so a lot of things we're going to look at now are um, how networks, how different processes differ when you look at maybe two different metrics at a time or three different metrics. I know three-dimensional three, three models sort of suck for presentation, but I'm going to try to explain them the best way I can. Um, so the picture we're looking at now is, again, we're looking at a 2D categorization of spread results. We're back in spread processes. And on the x-axis, we have spectral radius one more time. On the y-axis, we have EC variance. Right? We have the variance of a network. Each one of these nodes represents a different network. The color of the node represents some measure of time. So we're looking at spread. Blue represents a, s a quick spread time. And going all the way up to red means a really, really slow spread time. Right. And so if you just look for what I like about this model is it, it tells you where you need, it tells you where you may need more than one metric to explain the system. So if you look at lower values of spectral radius, it tells you that if you look at variance there, variance plays no role. We don't care about what variance is doing. Except maybe here, if you look at in models with higher spectral radius, maybe variance begins to play a role in how quickly you spread. All right? But still, we don't see that much stuff here. If we look at increasing spectral radius, it just tells us that you're going to have a slow spread time. That's fine. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this picture the same way it is. I'm going to lay it flat on its back. And then I'm going to increase it by the amount of networks you can have when you start considering skewness as well. Maybe that plays a role. All right. So this, is the, this was the same triangle here. I laid it flat on its back. And then I increased it 
by the level of skewness values. And then we start to see some variations in outcomes, again, where you would have thought that you should see slow spread times. Right? And then it means that in these systems, skewness seems to be a driver of very, um, variating uh, or varying um, ecological outcomes spread in this case. And in these cases, we actually have a reason why that's happening, is that in these cases where you have similar spectral radius, similar variance, but varying skewness, you get exactly into this case right here, where you have small skewness means you have a hub in your system. And so he's really driving spread everywhere, as long as you get there, right? In a six-node network, most likely you're going to get there. But well, you have slow spread here because you have one node that's really far from everything else. And so you have a lot of spread that's going on in these closer networks, but it's taking a long time to, to get to that one node. And so it makes sense in those systems. And of course, you have to look at the relative distance here versus there. So it makes sense in these systems why it's doing what it's doing. And here's a case where looking, you have to look down to three levels to really get an appreciation for what's going on, why these systems are different, why you have a difference in spread. Okay. Now we look at a 2D categorization of survival results as well. And here, I like this picture. I love this picture a lot because it's like colors of the rainbow. It's my colorful picture. I love it. All right. And here already, before we, before we go even further, in survival, you can see that variance already plays a role. Right? It's not the boring picture of spread already depending on where you are in the spectral radius, whatever network you're in the spectral radius, increasing variance always seems to increase the amount of time you can stay um, active, the, amount, the persistence time, right? And that's because as you increase variance, you also have this one node that's a hub. And that's great for um, dispersing prairie dogs, right? I like this feature because at certain points, variance doesn't matter anymore, but depending on where you are, Variance plays a big role. And the place we like to highlight is points like this, where when you fix spectral radius, depending on what variance you have, you can have all the colors of the rainbow. You can have things that, that survive for a long time or things that don't. All right. So we do the, uh, again, we do the same thing. We take this picture, lay it flat, flat on its back. Do we get variation when we increase by skewness? Absolutely. We get a lot of variation when we, when we um, when we um, also vary by skewness. But now, what I won't even try to do is explain the sort of variation we get. The variation we get o over in the variance picture is very clear. It's very linear. Increase variance, you increase your survival time. Clear. In pictures like this here, you'll notice that blue is the lowest point of persistence. It's happening somewhere in the middle, so there's some sort of a parabolic shape to it, and it's not even necessarily the cleanest parabolic shape. So there's some nonlinear survival going on there, and there's something we've been actually struggling to try to understand, and we don't understand why it's doing that yet. Um, and even that relationship that skewness is, is doing doesn't happen everywhere. So in some cases, skewness gives you this linear result between structure and survival. Some other cases, it doesn't do that. And we're still trying to understand why, it's, why, why that's happening. So it's not so clear. So one of the results, some of the, uh, one, one big conclusion we got out of doing this work was, yes, large variation in network configuration does not imply large variation in ecological outcome. If we look at the spread results versus the survival results, in the spread results, you didn't see that much variation at all. A lot of the, con a lot of the networks uh, led to quick dispersal. So this linkage between network structure and process is highly dependent on what process you're looking at. Sometimes it's a clean relationship. Sometimes it can get very, very messy. Sometimes it's linear. Sometimes it's nonlinear relationship. So it really depends. Of course, this is all within the context of the model I studied. Um, and I think, especially looking at survival results, it really, really um, highlights the um, positive things coming from the hierarchical approach is that in some scenarios you would need to go down different levels to multiple metrics to see um, 
d different variations in ecological outcome. You can get all the colors in the rainbow there. You can get low survival, high survival, quick spread, slow spread, and it all depends on how far you're willing to go down the system. And so we need to be really careful about the metrics we choose, and we need to be careful about, well, what do we want these networks for? And of course, one of the big conclusions is, of course, all this is experimental. I still don't know what skewness does, and I'm trying really hard to figure it out. So that's, uh, that's everything I got. So thanks for your time, and I will go with questions now.